Hey, how you doing? And welcome to The Rules of Investing, a podcast that gets inside the minds of leading investors, economists and industry experts, brought to you by Livewire Markets. I'm Ali Selby, and over the last week, we, you've been treated to some of the best sessions from Livewire Live 2024, with speakers covering a breadth of asset classes across both public and private markets. In this episode, we're back to our regular programming, and I'm honestly really pumped for this one. We're talking all about how artificial intelligence could help level up your investment process from a fund manager who has recently done it herself. We're speaking with Armina Arms Rosenberg, dubbed the Punk Rock Portfolio Manager by the Financial Review back in 2019. It's a label that stuck, whether Arms likes it or not, even though she no longer has pink hair, is a mother of two, and is happily residing in Sydney's beautiful Bronte. Today, you'll learn some of the major lessons Arms took away from her time investing for Australia's mega wealthy, including Atlassian's Mike Cannon-Brooks. And we're also going to discuss how Arms' new shop Minotaur Capital, formed alongside former Perpetual alumni Thomas Rice, is using artificial intelligence to identify long and short opportunities on the global stage. Plus, of course, we're also going to go through a few stock examples as well. If you're an Apple podcast or Spotify user, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss an episode. Or if you're a Livewire subscriber, hit the follow button at the bottom of the wire to be notified when new episodes are available. Not a Livewire subscriber yet? Just head on over to livewiremarkets.com. It's free, easy to register, and you'll get access to insights from leading investment minds in the country. Okay, that was a massive mouthful. Let's get on with the show. I'm really excited to feature you on the Rules of Investing Arms. I feel like I've been reaching out to you for years to try and interview you. So thank you. I'm glad we're finally here today. Yeah, me too. I'm glad that we're doing this. Although I still maintain we should have just gotten AI to generate this podcast <laughs> and then go and have cocktails or something. But we'll do it. We'll do it properly. Well, can all us dos. <laughs> as I mentioned in the intro, you have managed money for the ultra wealthy in Australia, as well as working at JP Morgan. You also worked at a family office called Auden Investments. And then obviously, more recently, Grok Ventures. What were some of the major lessons you learned during that time? Yeah, sure. So I grew up at JP Morgan and I learned all the basics of how markets work and how to analyse company there. Um, and I think that the two big lessons I took away from there was, number one, that earnings don't equal cash flows um, and that earnings can be easily manipulated. Um, one of the examples of that, I'd say, is I had a sell recommendation on a company called Retail Food Group. And the main reason for it is I could see that they were writing down property plan and equipment every year. And that meant they were under depreciating their asset base, which means they're overstating their earnings. Um, it was pretty clear to see. Um, I copped a nine page email from the CEO of that company saying I was an absolute idiot, <sighs> um, which was a bit hard at 20, 24 years of age, I think I was. But, uh, you know, that's that's kind of, as you know, the name of the game in Aussie small caps. Sometimes there's a lot of emotions that run through those CEOs. Um, but that was one big lesson. Um, I'd say that the other big lesson is that the best opportunities come from uh, where something is fundamentally misunderstood about a company and that leads to a mispricing of the company. An example of that, again, from the JP Morgan days was Flight Center. So Flight Center was one of the most uh, shorted stocks in the market at the time. It still is. Still is. Um, and I think back then it was because you had seen the demise of bricks and mortar travel agents in the States and people had just assumed that that would happen in Australia. But travel is, as you know, being a fellow Aussie, very different in Australia where you have complex itineraries, multiple stops, um, you know, you take like cars and trains and, and planes mm. and you kind of need a travel agent a little bit to hold your hand um, in that process. That was definitely the case, what, like 10, 11, 12 years ago when I covered Flight Centre. Maybe not so much now, but I know back then, um, the sell or the, the, the heavy shorting was probably not warranted. Um, and that was actually a pretty good call for me. Um, moving from the sell side to the buy side, it might seem obvious, but the most important lesson is that you actually have to pick the right investments. Um, on the sell side, there are many models that can work to make you successful. So, you know, you could be, um, I guess the corporate access person who got who gets lots of uh, meetings with with kind of different companies. 
you could be the detailed models person or you could be just someone fun to have beers with. All of those models work um, for getting you commissions for, from, the, from the buy side. Um, but on the buy side, you've got to put your money where your mouth is and it's the classic, like, you know, show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. You've got to get those calls right. Um, and I think the model that I have found the most successful on that buy side is that first kind of lesson that I spoke about earlier, which was that you need to um, find there's something that's being fundamentally mispriced by the market about a stock. Are there any lessons you learned that were unique to working in, I guess, family offices? Yeah, family offices are a really interesting beast. Um, so I worked, i just give a brief um, background to the two that I worked for. So Audant Investments was run by a uh, funds management and property development guy called Robert White. Robert was over 70 years old in capital preservation mode, concerned with yield, not so much with sort of capital growth. And then you had Mike, um, Mike Cannon-Brooks, who's the, one of the co-founders and the CEO of Atlassian. Mike was... Um, not yet 40 uh, when I joined him. He uh, was happy to take on a lot of risk um, and both in the name of learning and high returns. Uh, and he you know, obviously had a very constructive view on, on technology. Um, and I will say that with family offices, like that old adage of like, you've seen one family office and you've seen one family office does hold. One interesting thing about family offices is there seems to be two different schools of thought on, you know, how you invest uh, based on how you sort of made the money in the first place. So what I mean by that is if you're a property family, mm. there's one school of thought that says, hey, let's diversify away from property because that's how we made our money. Mm. And there's another school of thought, which is, hey, property is where we have our sort of subject matter expertise. So let's double down on that and kind of majority invest in property. Both are really interesting kind of, you know, ways to take. Um, I'd say at Grok, we were more of the latter. So we um, invested really heavily into US software stocks. We definitely saw the downsides to that, um, you know, in 2022, like there's there's heavy volatility when you're in, um, in highly correlated environments where when you're just like looking at kind of one factor or I guess one exposure, you're going to move according to that exposure, no matter how sort of idiosyncratic you think your stock risk is. So that was an interesting lesson in itself as well. Are the families themselves involved in the investment process or they just, I guess, leave it completely up to you? Um, I think in both cases of the family offices that I worked with, uh, the family was pretty involved um, and mainly the principals, so Robert and, and Mike. Um, the mandate with Mike was to marry his sort of tech knowledge with my investment knowledge and then arrive at a portfolio of stocks, kind of like a you know, a inside running into, you know, who, who's going to actually be a good investment. That has a, that's a double-edged sword as well. Like we were big investors in the Zoom IPO um, and that was great because we got this amazing allocation because Mike was really good friends with CEO Eric Yuan, but it also meant that whenever we wanted to sell it, it was a bit awkward. Um, and yeah, I was kind of having to manage, I guess, relationships personally as well. Um, I would say across family offices generally, it's a bit of a mix of like how involved the family families get. I also run a networking group of women investors in family offices called The Fold. And that has representation from families of like tens of millions to billions. And it's pretty far ranging in terms of how involved the families are in that. I'd say the membership of that group is probably about 50-50 family members and outsiders that are put in to, to run the family money for them. Okay, interesting. You kind of touched on it there, there's kind of two different ways that family offices invest. I want to know the difference between how the mega wealthy invest compared to the average Australian. Are there different asset classes that they focus on or different opportunities? What investments do they typically prefer? I think that family offices and, and ultra high net worth, they see a lot more opportunities than the average investor. So they can actually play across all asset classes much more easily. Um, a lot of them do employ that sort of classic strategic asset allocation endowment model um, that you might have heard of from like Yale and David Swenson of like, you know, a certain allocation or percentage to equities and bonds and private equity and private credit and the like. Um, but they're pretty different in how those allocations kind of um, 
I guess, make up the, the 100% of the portfolio. And again, that's based on how much uh, experience they've had with it, uh, that asset class and what's generated them that wealth. Mm, okay. As I mentioned in the intro, you recently launched your own shop with former perpetual portfolio manager, Thomas Rice. There's obviously quite a lot of other global equities funds out there in the Aussie landscape. What makes you guys different? The big thing that makes us different is that software and technology is at the heart of everything we do here at Minotaur. Um, Traditional funds management has been run sort of the same way for the last three decades, but the pace of technological change has accelerated since then, and particularly in the last 18 months. Um, You think about, you know, artificial intelligence and large language models, that gives us the ability to understand natural language in an unprecedented way. And we actually think that not using generative AI in your processes now is analogous to using pen and paper to model a company instead of Excel. Um, And so I should point out, like we are a fundamental equities fund, we're not a quant fund. Um, The difference is that we just use AI and LLMs and other technology to make all of those processes much more efficient, much faster. Um, We've developed our own proprietary software to to run the fund. And I think that's another way in which Minotaur is unique. Um, My co-founder, co-portfolio manager, Thomas Rice, he's a bit of a unicorn in that I think he's probably one of the only fund managers in Australia that knows how to code and develop software. Mm. And like really well like I thought that I could code I was like oh yeah in Visual Basic and Excel I can code um you know Thomas is a a proper developer and he's self-taught so he's been kind of coding since he was 13. Um, I actually remember Mike saying that the best developers are self-taught developers because they kind of like go through things from first principles um and so Thomas Thomas is a key example of that and you know for my part I've seen firsthand how some of the greatest uh, tech founders um, in Australia operate, obviously through Atlassian, but also have good relationships with the likes of Canva and Safety Culture and Culture Amp. Um, so I think I bring some of that technology knowledge to bear. And I'm also kind of the first user for Thomas. So um, I'm kind of the person that really tests and, and breaks things. Um, and he just iterates on it straight away. I think it took him maybe two months to kind of do the bulk of the coding for Torient, which is the name of our software system. But we iterated on it all the time and we can do that because of that in-house development skill. Um, I think the last thing that sets us apart is, despite us having collectively 35 years of experience between us, we're actually quite young for the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have very different backgrounds to most people you'd find in the industry. So, you know, we're both from Asian backgrounds, um, I'm from a really low sort of socio-demographic background originally, like I grew up in Housing Commission um, in Western Sydney. Um, and, you know, obviously I'm female, so that's a bit of a, <laughs> can be a rarity in this industry. Uh, and the only reason that's important is I really think that a diversity of perspective really informs investment decision making. Like if you think about it, if you're only ever exposed to the Aussie market, you're only ever going to want to look at the Aussie market. But if you go to China or Taiwan or Indonesia, you're going to be more positively predisposed to looking at opportunities in those markets. Mm, 100%. And if you're in a room filled with private school boys who've (laughs) all grown up in maybe the eastern suburbs or the lower north shore, it's probably quite a lot of confirmation bias there as well. I'm really interested to know, you obviously have very unique backgrounds, both you and Thomas. How did you even meet? Yeah, so we actually met uh, when I was back at JP Morgan on the sales side. I was broking um, Aussie small cap consumer discretionary and tourism names to Thomas, like What If and Webjet. Um, and it was actually Thomas who uh, introduced me to, to Mike Cannon Brooks. Um, and I'll get to that story in a minute. But basically, Thomas and I, you know, in discussing stocks, we found that we were aligned in investment philosophy. Um, we stayed in touch. When I moved into the family office world, we'd still meet up. Um, Uh, The way that Thomas met Mike um, is, it was back in 2011, it was a Macquarie internet conference. And, you know, this was before Atlassian had IPO'd, it was before um, Atlassian or Mike was a household name that it is today. Uh, And Thomas went to the Macquarie internet conference and Mike sat down next to him just by chance. Thomas turned to him and said, oh, you're Mike Hannah-Brooks, I use Jira and Confluence uh, when I'm coding. 
And Mike was like, oh, what? You're a fund manager that codes? Is that like a usual thing? He's like, oh, no, not really. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, and it's funny because Mike was actually there because he thought Atlassian might IPO one day and he wanted to see what a tech CEO presenting looks like and kind of get tips from it. What this um, led to was Thomas, I think in the next week, was invited to the Atlassian offices to watch Mike and Scott practice their IPO pitch. And Thomas actually sent them an email saying, look, I, th I think you talk about these things well, but work on these, uh, which is pretty funny uh, given Atlassian's meteoric rise. I, um, I often joke with Thomas that we should print off that email and put it on our wall in the Minotaur office. <laughs> Yeah, 100%. If he can do that with Atlassian, what else could he do it with, I guess? Yeah. As you mentioned earlier, Minotaur has developed its own artificial intelligence back system that you use to inform your investment decisions. How does that even work? Yeah, so as I said, the software system is called Torient. Um, we've developed it in-house. I'd love to actually... It's kind of a unique name because I, I can speak Spanish and I know Toro obviously means bull. Yeah. So why the name Torient? Well, I think Minotaur, Torient, mm. and like a way to Lots orient. Of bulls. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of bulls. Uh, although we 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 think that we can outperform in both bull and bear markets to be <laughs> to to be uh, to just outline that. Um, yeah, I'd love to show you a demo of the software sometime. So we'll have to we'll have to um, organize that. Yeah, I'd love that. Um, but you can think of Torient as the operating system of Minotaur. So every part of the investment process that can be enhanced with technology, we do that with Torient where possible. What, would, what do you mean by that? What would every part look like for that? So it's everything from like generating ideas, triaging ideas, tracking them, generating uh, snapshots, which is like a, a small company overview, um, tracking research workflows, and then calculating and monitoring risk metrics and suggesting portfolio weights. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, to get granular, uh, the way that it works across our, step uh, across our workflow is the first step is idea generation, right? So... If you think about the problems that fund managers face, I'd say the first is idea generation because there's 60,000 listed companies out there. There's 10,000 if you want to go billion dollar plus. Most fund managers say, oh, we'll just focus on a subset of that um, because of that, what we're specializing in. Or they like put in kind of random quant filters like we'll just look at PEs below 10 times and ROEs above X percent. Yeah. Um, but we think quant filters are sort of done in terms of a competitive advantage. The way that Torrent works is it ingests about 5,000 news articles a day and it puts those articles through a series of LLMs um, through prompts that we have uh, kind of come up with ourselves that, that are proprietary. What would be an example of a prompt for that? So one of the things that we think, and I'm kind of talked about it before with the mispricing, but we think when a company undergoes a strategy change, that's an interesting time to look at a company either from the long or short side. And so we'll so say to Torrent- like search strategy change? <laughs> no, so it's, it's not, <laughs> it's not a Google <laughs> search engine. No, it's probably, I think the prompt is probably about three quarters of a page long. Um, and it also uses like, LLMs are most powerful when you use chain of logic. So it's when you ask it a question and then it gives you an answer and then you give it another question based on that answer. That's when LLMs are the most powerful. So you are most better off when you're like breaking things down into step by step. Um, and so with that prompt for the strategy change one, you know, we fed it dozens of examples of what we're looking for. Because what we found was the first time we ran that prompt, it said things like, oh, Walmart's increased its dividend. And we're like, well, that's not a strategy change. Um, so now we like put in, you know, M&A or uh, an activist that's getting heavily involved or a new product line. Actually, to talk about a specific example, the, um, the whole idea of this came about from uh, a company called Axon Enterprise. And Axon was... The body cameras, right? Yeah. 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 So Axon was the best performing stock in Thomas's fund. And the way that Thomas found Axon was he was randomly on CNBC's website back in 2017, I think. And the article talked about how Axon makes all the police tasers in the world, but it was getting into body cameras. Um, and it was actually losing a lot of money on body cameras because the way that the business model worked was... They gave away body cameras for free to police officers. The police officer would take off the body camera, put it in a dock, and it would upload all the image data 
into a cloud-based platform called evidence.com and they'd charge like a monthly subscription fee for that. So it was probably one of the earliest examples of a SaaS-based business model. But existing investors in Axon hated it because they were used to Taser, which was this monopoly. Like Taser is actually a brand. The product is Stun Gun, but you can't name any other brand of Stun Gun, right? Um, and yeah, the Taser investors were like, well, this is a... Oh my God, sorry, sorry. Taser <laughs> is like Kleenex. Yes, correct. I uh, did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly right. And Axon, that's Axon's brand, right? Wow. And so it was kind of growing like 10% top line every year, throwing off free cash flows. Investors loved it. But because they were plowing all this money into body cameras, it looked like it was trading on a headline PE of like 70 times. But if you stripped out the losses of body cameras, it was on 20 times. And actually Thomas was like, well, body cameras, think I think they're going to be pretty important. Like this was around the time of Black Lives Matters and police yeah. brutality, you know, scrutiny. Um, and he was right. So I think it ended up 10xing in his fund. Um, but it occurred to him that if he wasn't randomly on CNBC that day, he would have missed his best performing stock. So we were thinking like, how do we take that randomness and make it systematize? And that's where that idea generation comes through. Mm. Um, the second step is uh, idea prioritization. So, you know, you get given a whole bunch of ideas. How do you prioritize what to work on? Um, Obviously, you want to prioritize what's going to generate you the best returns, but you don't really know what's going to do that. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. What you do know about a stock is a whole bunch of things to do with how it might affect the risk of your portfolio. So things like what sector is it in, um, what country, uh, what factor exposures it has. Um, the prioritization score, we call it an idea score actually in Torian, it basically gives us a number which is based on how much it will affect the risk and diversification statistics of our current portfolio. So it's a fully sort of integrated system. What's and then the it, number out of? It's actually out of 100 and it just kind of like um, toggles it based on like, I can only think of an example. Oh yeah, like things like you have a lot of industrials in your portfolio. This is an industrial, so we'll downweight that. Um, mm. Or you've got a lot of Japan, you're super overweight Japan, you're probably too overweight Japan and we want to lessen Japan risk so like we'll overweight all the other kind of countries. That's kind of how it works. What would be like the average number that you'd have in your portfolio? I think it's like 60 or 70. Right. Um, there are things that like are up to 90 and like, you know, I should say like AI does a lot of stuff but there's human intervention all along the way. So just because something ranks like at a 93, doesn't necessarily mean Thomas and I will work on it first. It just gets ranked higher up the page. But we could still go, oh, no, we really think there's a good opportunity in this one that's ranked 60th. So, um, yeah, it's interesting in that way that it's like the interplay between the AI and, I guess, judge human judgment, our judgment, um, that what it, that's kind of forms the backbone of how Minotaur works. What's the third step, if there is one? Uh, the third step is the snapshot. So... Torrent generates about an automated 2,000 word report. Um, think of it like a mini initiation report. So it goes through like what the company does, its revenue and earnings drivers, what makes it interesting, if anything, the bull and bear case. Wow. I think the, the craziest thing that it does is it does form a view on whether the stock can double in three years or 10x in 10 years. Um, and this was a report that we used to get our analysts to write. Um, so. I think the investment analysts in Thomas's team at Perpetual used to take maybe five days to write this report. Thomas or I, if we were doing it, it would still probably take us a day. I think Torian generates the average report in under two minutes. Holy shit. Um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so any sell side analyst listening, this is potentially bearish for you. But um, yeah, it's, and, it's, and it gives us that view. And um, the reason that's so powerful is we can just turn over a lot more rocks faster, right? So I think in global, when you can look at anything in the world, it's just important to get through the amount of ideas in, in sort of a quick fashion. And that's what it does. I want to get back to uh, t of 10 baggers later on because I know our audience loves that. <laughs> Before you talked about it, helping you with waiting, how does it actually do that? Yeah, so we there's a part in, in, in Torient where we get given our portfolio and in real time you can adjust the weights and then see how it affects a whole bunch of risk parameters um, and factor exposures. So it'll tell you how it's impacted the portfolio volatility or this thing called parametric value at risk, which is essentially how much um, will the portfolio fall if, if the market falls. Um, and so it's, it's kind of 
yeah, it goes through a whole bunch of things and you can adjust it in real time. Again, like back at back at Perpetual, Thomas had a risk analytics team that would send you this stuff, but they'd send it two weeks um, in an Excel spread, static Excel spreadsheet, two weeks after, like the month before, about the month. So it's like... What's the point? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, thanks for telling me what my risk parameters were two weeks ago, right? Um, so this is done in, in real time. Um, and we're very, very cognizant of risk. Uh, it's a, like our portfolio, even though Thomas and I have tech backgrounds, where where the tech is at play is in kind of the background backbone of the um, of the fund itself. But we're investors in, you know, all caps, all sectors, all regions. Um, so it's a generalist fund. Sounds like there's quite a lot of reliance on AI. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Or is there also, I guess, some more fundamental investing as well at play? Yeah, look, AI is important to us, but it's used to augment our investment process rather than replace the human judgment. And as I said, we, we do rely on it like without AI. It's not like we'd be able to read 5,000 articles a day. Um, and it obviously turns processes from five days to two minutes. Uh, but I think what's important to, to note is it's all based on Thomas and I's experience in investing. So um, what I mean by that is like take the strategy change funnel, for example, most you know, most I said, like average people wouldn't necessarily know to look for a strategy change as a way to play a stock. And then they probably wouldn't know how to like, you know, think about interrogating that prompt. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's what's even more interesting is another fund manager might not agree with that as a prompt. So it is based on what Thomas and I think is worth investing in. So I think it's still important to have those, that years of investing experience that Thomas and I do. Mm. Does it help at all with selling? I feel like that is my greatest weakness. I never know when to cut my losses or when to sell my winners. Do you think it helps with that kind of thing too? Yeah, so um, we embed price targets in to the system. And so if something's about to hit its price target, it'll say that and it'll force us to look at it and think, should we move the price target up or should we um, sell it? So in that way, it kind of is a forcing function for that. Um, but also we get it to like, we can put in things like, oh, we want to be more exposed to Japan because we like the macro there or China because we like the macro there. And so it'll say, well, these are the stocks in your portfolio that are exposed to that. So upweight them and maybe take out these because they have less exposure to China or Japan. Wow. So, yes, it helps on the, it helps on that portfolio optimization side. There's definitely more code that we need to do there for sure. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's and you know this is a really exciting thing about it is because it's us using the platform, we can just continue to develop on it all the time. Is this something that people like me, our our audience, they could develop themselves or use themselves? Like I would love to use something <laughs> like this. Is this something that our audience could could develop themselves? It's funny we get asked by investors about this a lot. Like, oh, can we get our hands on the on the software? Mm. Um, it kind of, kind of goes back to that like. It's it's very much geared towards replicating Amina and Thomas at the moment. Mm. And so if you're not Amina and Thomas, you might not agree with the way that we look at things. Um, similarly, like if a fund manager had an engineering team, like could they code this up? I don't think so because there's a lot of nuanced things about it. For example, all of our stock pages have the factor exposures of the, of the stock calculated. And... That was hard to code, but not because it was hard to write the code. It was hard to figure out how do you fi figure out the factor exposures of a stock, right? Like, um, how do you how do you say a stock is positively disposed to value or growth or the like? Um, you need an investing person to be able to say that and to be able to code that in. So, um, yeah, it's one of those like you need that that kind of Venn diagram of investing and development to to be able to develop something like this. We might white label Torian at some point in the future never say never we're very concentrated on on just running the fund at the moment for retail investors who are keen to incorporate ai into their investment process is there one prompt that you think is particularly helpful that they could put into chat gpt or try and create investment ideas themselves using ai i think one of the things that's really helped me is don't put in just a question like you know, give me a company that is undergoing a strategy change or even something like, 
is Apple undergoing a strategy change? It's, it, it's really, really good when it has context to work with. So the way that we engineer our prompts is to say things like, you are a financial analyst with 20 years investing experience. Wow. You've been charged to look at a financial statement. You're looking for X, Y, and Z in the financial statement to see if that raises any red flags. You know, what's, can you come up with a 2000 page report, sorry, 2000 word report on, you know, what could be potential red flags in this, in this report? So that's kind of, it's, it's about kind of almost giving it a persona to work with. Um, this hasn't like Thomas is actually developing this now, but he's at this point in time developing like several personalities that sort of talk to each other in order to kind of like an investment team, I guess, in order to like um, like specialize in certain areas of expertise to do with financial statement analysis so that we can come up with um, an earnings report or a report based on when a com- one of our companies in our portfolio reports earnings. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. Like that's pretty Definitely. advanced coding. Um, but yeah, that's probably, I think that's the biggest game changer for me in terms of getting more out of LLMs. I'd say that the other thing is it don't treat it statically, treat it dynamically. So have a conversation with it. Um, and you know, this extends to like things beyond investment. Um, I had a full sort of philosophical debate or yeah, philosophical debate around um, where modern Arab anti-Semitism stems from. And I basically got the LLM to change its mind by the end of the conversation just by like continually interrogating that the, argu- the arguments it was making. So just treat it like like you and I, you know, having a conversation. Wow, that's crazy. What does this mean for the future of funds management? You said beware sell-side analysts before. <laughs> you know, if we can develop large language models that can act as a team of analysts, what does that mean for the future of funds management? Yeah, I've, I mean, the other way that people have asked me that question is like, how do you hire for a team now? Like, if you don't need an investment analyst, how do you hire for a team? How do, how do people learn that sort of higher order thinking? You, honestly, it's a really tricky thing to answer, but I think the answer is exactly what we just talked about. Like, how do you prompt better? Um, and how do you use the AI tools better? And again, think of it like Excel, right? So we used to model um, discounted cash flows with pen and paper, but then we learned how to do it with Excel and we learned how to optimize Excel in order to do that. I think that's the, the kind of, the future is how do we optimize AI for a bunch of use cases, not just investing. Um, I think that there's still a world where you need a fundamental fund. Like the other thing that people always ask me is, do you think, AI will eventually run your whole fund for you. Um, And to an extent, that's kind of what we're doing in that we're codifying an AI version of Thomas and Arms. Um, I think we're a a fair way away from that though. Uh, I think that there's still a lot of like human intervention that's gonna happen. And um, that's definitely the case for me. Um, I don't think many people in the industry are using AI like you are. I definitely haven't spoken to anyone who's using AI like you are. Yeah. What do you think happens to the fund managers who don't embrace AI with open arms? Like, honestly, I think that it's like going to be very hard to compete with that. Um, I think, as I said, like the quant filters being competed away, I think it's the same with, you know, fundamental analysis, like, especially if it's limited to looking at the same markets that everyone else is interrogating. Um, one of the really interesting things about AI and LLMs for us is it's naturally multilingual. So I talked before about how most fund managers don't really look at other non-English speaking markets. Like you can really easily do that now. So you know, some of our key stock calls have come from a local Japanese newspaper called Asahi Shimbun or a local French newspaper called Les Course. And though both of those things are written in Japanese and French, so I can't read them, but the AI translates it and translates it not in the way that Google Translate does, like says this is the crux of, of what these guys are talking about. So um, yeah, I, I think it's gonna be a must have eventually. Definitely slow to move in Australia and we're trying to take advantage of that being like first movers. You are seeing it somewhat like globally come through. Like I think the Citadels and the Tigers, the guys that are sort of you know more tech savvy are onto it. Um, 
you're also seeing it play out more in that risk mitigation space. So kind of more along that portfolio optimization construction stuff we were talking about earlier. I want to get into where you're seeing opportunity today. Are there any themes that you feel like are really exciting on a longer term view? Yeah, I mean, probably doesn't surprise you that we see opportunities in AI. Um, (laughs) We also see opportunities in energy and decarbonisation and healthcare and sort of new wave consumer. Um, I think all of those sectors also dovetail as well. Just on AI, the reason it's really easy to construct a bull case there is like, if you think about even the small microcosm of the Minotaur Fund, we could easily see our usage of AI 100xing in the next year. Right, it, like I can't tell you how many things we use it for more now than we did like a couple of months ago. And when we went from, when we switched our um, processes over from GPT-4 to GPT-4 Omni, our um, costs halved and our speed doubled. Like wow. that's just insane. So those rates of learning are just like, and then back to that question you had earlier of like, you know, can people do this without AI? When you've got those rates of learnings, like it's, you'd be, if you don't get on the train, it's going to speed past you basically. Um, And we're very much in the first innings of that AI wave. Like if you talk to a lot of the companies out there, I think Morgan Stanley did a a survey of a bunch of CIOs and um, 26% of them said that they're starting their first AI project in late 2025. So like we're still very early in in, in the innings. Having said that, there's obviously a lot of hype out there around AI. Uh, And you saw that in the last quarterly results, I think that there was a bit of a fear that um, people are spending, um, you know, sort of rampantly without regard for how the return on investment is gonna work through. Um, It it is hard to, definitely hard to call. I mean, I think even open AI is gonna spend $5 billion on training costs in the next year. It didn't stop them from raising six billion at a hundred fifty seven billion valuation <laughs> recently, but yeah, there you have it. Um, so I think that the best way at the moment to play AI, and I think the market has gotten this to some extent, is through the energy side. Um, obviously, AI is a big impost on our energy um, usage, and you know AI is going to be responsible for like a third of data center power usage. And um, I think the first kind of bottlenecks of that was the semiconductors, but now you're seeing it play out in sort of the broader energy and utility company environment. And people are playing that through like grid modernization companies and um, I guess renewable energy sources and the like. Can you provide any examples of the energy companies you're really liking? Yeah, so there's one of our the key holdings in our portfolio is a stock called Prismian. Um, Prismian is an Italian subsea cable operator. And so I think when people think about like decarb generally, or even just energy generally, you know, there's a lot of regard for like solar panels and wind turbines, but Prismian constructs all of the cables needed to get energy from one place to another. And so they're like the highways of energy. And I think that they're going to be really important, um, in kind of the world to come. Um, Prismian is, um, I think, a really good allocator of capital. So management um, has made a lot of acquisitions, but they've um, they've uh, proven themselves to be good capital allocators. And the subsea cable market in particular is quite niche. There's actually only three companies in the world that can make subsea cables. That's Prismian, NKT, and Nexans. They collectively hold an 86% market share of wow. that market. Um, and it's one of those things where when a government decides it wants to modernize its grid or if they've built an offshore wind farm and they want to um, lay a cable from that offshore wind farm into their country, they want to make sure it works, obviously. So they're going to stick to the companies that they know has the expertise in doing it. Um, and that's, that's those three companies. And uh, I think all three companies have a backlog of about five years on those projects um, because there's just so much demand on it. Um, the other thing that's really exciting about Prismian is uh, management's quite conservative in the way that they set earnings targets. Um, they have a 2 billion euro EBITDA target for 2027. Um, I think that that could be closer to 3 billion um, and the market is definitely not having the full regard for that that I think it should. You talked to before you're bullish on AI. Are you backing stocks like Nvidia or are you finding smaller players that you like instead? Um, I think on the AI front, where 
probably more concerned with the smaller players. We are actually underweight um, NVIDIA in our portfolio. Uh, we're underweight most of, oh, I think all of the Magnificent Seven. We've do, we do have Meta, Amazon, but we're generally underweight, the US tech, uh, probably mostly on valuation. Um, I think with AI, again, we're, we're playing it through mostly the energy names, the data center names. There's a company called Vertiv, which is a um, company that is uh, concerned with cooling, optimizing cooling systems for data centers. So that's another way we're playing it. How about in healthcare? You said before you're seeing opportunity in healthcare over the long term. How are you playing that? Yeah, I think we're kind of doing it in sort of niche ways. So, I mean, there's obviously been a lot of hype around GLP ones uh, as a as an area of, of health. Um, and people are really familiar with Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly um, and Azempic and Wegovi. Um, there's a company called Chugai Pharmaceutical, which is in Japan. Um, and generally we see Japan as a way to play obvious themes with non-obvious names. Um, and so Chugai is developing an oral GLP-1 called Orphoglopron. And um, basically it's gonna get its sort of results for phase three in sort of 2025. Um, but so far it's been shown to generate the same weight loss results as like the Azempics and the Wigovies, um, except that because it's oral, it's more in the, um, in the form of a oral pill that you can take every day, whereas obviously a Zempic is, in, is an injectable. Um, and that increases the addressable market, like, you know, many fold because um, obviously not many people, not everyone is very comfortable with injectables, but most or people, needles, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> most people are comfortable taking a pill every day. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that's a company that's really leveraged to, to that thematic. You've talked um, so much about Japan today. I feel like I keep <laughs> hearing Japan. Yeah. Before you said you're kind of underweight, the US mag mega cap stocks. Are you focusing on Japan, maybe China instead? Where are you seeing value? Yeah, we're pretty much seeing value in most places outside of the US, actually. Um, but specifically Europe and Asia. Um, I think that... Um, Japan is kind of going through a once in a generation opportunity in terms of really improving the corporate governance there. So there's been a real focus um, of management teams there to be a little bit more, um, I guess, friendly towards investors. Japan hasn't been a market that's overly friendly towards investors. Like they, you know, typically don't um, translate their annual reports and the like. They don't really take meetings with <laughs> English speaking investors. That's changing. Um, there's also been a pickup in Japanese inflation, which has allowed companies to lift prices and boost revenue and earnings, um, you know, for the first time in ages. And uh, there's been increased government spending and export growth in Japan. So we're very constructive on the Japanese market. It's gone through some volatile times recently with this yen carry trade volatility, which mm. I won't go into, but um, I don't think that changes kind of that long-term structural opportunity there. Mm. Also increased tourism there. Everyone I know... <laughs> has gone to Japan this year is going next year. It is truly crazy. Yeah. Is it possible you could provide some examples of companies you are short? You've talked about quite a few longs today. Yeah. Are you willing to share some shorts? We aren't usually, but just because it's you, Ali, <laughs> I'll share one short. Um, so a company we've been short is EXP World. Now, EXP World is a virtual real estate brokerage. So... What that means is you don't need a bricks and mortar location if you're a real estate agent. Um, and so that business model sounds good because it obviously lowers the operating costs of a real estate agent. You could probably get economies of scale um, and lower the cost to consumers as well. The problem with it is it's a very commoditized business model. So if you can do one virtual real estate brokerage, you, like another company can very easily um, create one as well. Uh, which is what you've seen happen. So there's a competitor called Real Brokerage. And it started out, uh, I was seeing some YouTube videos of agents that had defected from EXP World into Real Brokerage. And uh, they lost a really big agent group in January, um, which I think was responsible for like 300 million in sales of, of real estate in, in the US. And, um, you know, they defected. 
But what's really interesting about EXP World is we realised that they were giving us the answer in that they would report the number of agents that use their platform in real time on their website. And so because Thomas is Thomas, he built a scraper um, to scrape that, their website every day so we would see the number of agents and we could see it slowly ticking down and the share price was correlated. So every time the, the agents would tick down, the share price was ticking down too. Now, unfortunately, they have cottoned onto this um, and so they, I think a couple of weeks ago, stopped disclosing the number of agents um, yeah. using their platform on the site, which is a bit of a bummer, but also a big red flag if I ever saw one. Look, I don't think that that business, I think that business ceases to exist, so I'm happy to, to kind of keep shorting it here. Um, there will be sort of swings and roundabouts in it because obviously property is um, inherently tied to interest rates. Um, and as you're seeing interest rates get cut, you might be seeing some um, some more optimism around the property market. But um, yeah, I think that that's a, a business that's going to be in real trouble. Okay, we've come to the end of the podcast where we ask a few fun questions. They're meant to be a thought experiment. Mm -hmm. What is one thing the market is getting wrong today? Oh, look, I'm going to talk my book here, but I think that the one thing that markets generally are getting wrong is that private credit is the bee's knees. <laughs> I think that, uh, you know, the chickens will come home to roost in, in the private credit market at some point. There's been a lot of money that's been thrown at that market in a short period of time. Mm. and Particularly commercial real estate debt. Yeah. yeah. And just because a fund is able to, like, come up with their own valuations of the company's um, private debt doesn't mean it's right. Like, I think Bloomberg um, did a survey and found that the same – the, sorry, the private lenders on the same company had like widely different marks on certain private debt. So I think there was one company where one lender was marking it at 45 cents on the dollar and another was on uh, 89 cents on the dollar. And it's like, that's a, that's a spread that you could park a truck in, right? <laughs> so, you know, what's right and what's wrong there? Um, I am talking my book a little bit because it's, it is very well loved by like the family office high net worth um, kind of environment in Australia at the moment. Well, the returns are amazing. Yeah. Like 10% <laughs> sounds incredible, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and then, then also we're being sold as if there's no cycle, that there's no risk, which is so crazy. So crazy when you think about what we've been through in the yeah. past. Um, yeah. And look, there's like, there's there's definitely, like, you know, I don't think a crash is imminent, but I do think that... Um, private markets yeah just because you don't have to say what your valuations are doesn't mean that there's non-valuation that's why i stick to public markets i like the transparency there um i would say there are some good private credit managers not everyone is bad there's definitely <laughs> some really good talented private credit managers out there i think people just have to be selective yeah just as they would be selective with you know equities fund managers as well there's obviously great fund managers out there and those that you know haven't have been unperforming and probably will continue to underperform yeah okay let's talk about a story of a big win or a big loss from your investment journey I prefer prefer the losses I feel like you learn so much more from them I've definitely learned the most from my terrible mistakes <laughs> so if you have a loss that would be awesome but if not you can tell us about a win and what you learned from that experience well if you've got time I'd love to do both um, I, on the wind side, I'll try and do this pretty quickly, but on the wind side, um, I talked about Zoom earlier. Um, Zoom was a big win for me. And um, I think what's interesting about Zoom is the approach that I took and the, the approach that Thomas took are completely different, but they were wins. It was a win for both of us in our respective portfolios. Um, I went to San Francisco. I met with a whole bunch of like sales and account managers at Zoom. Um, you know, got a bunch of contacts there. And then when COVID hit, the share price of Zoom actually took a little while to react to its increasing popularity, mainly because there was a lot of concern that enterprises um, wouldn't sign up with Zoom because of the uh, risks around China and security. Um, I spoke to those sales and account managers I met and, you know, they told me that those fears were overblown. And so that made me highly convicted on the stock. For Thomas, um, he took a bit of a different approach. So he realised that, you know, whenever someone gives you a Zoom link, they give you a subdomain. So it's like zoom.jpmorgan.us or zoom.atlassian.com.au. Um, 
So what he did was he took the Fortune 500, guessed their subdomain, came up with some code to figure out whether that subdomain exists, but then also figured out that you could pay a cybersecurity firm to find out when it exists. So just kind of adding those two things together, you could find out how many clients in the Fortune 500 Zoom was adding and when they added them. And then that led him to be bullish on Zoom as well. Now, it's obviously underperformed since because when you have a competitor, i.e. Microsoft, offering your product for free, um, that's really hard. But it was and a really good win Google for us. Same Meets as well. Yeah, exactly. Although I, don't, I hate Teams and Meets calls, to be honest. Yeah. I still really love Zoom. I um, hate all of them. I would much <laughs> prefer to talk to people in person. I hate Zoom calls. <laughs> I definitely I like to chat in person. I like to see people's faces and actually have a, a good talk. Yeah. Okay, yeah. a story of a loss. Oh, yeah, story of a loss. I'll make it quick. Um, so I think just broadly, the loss for both Thomas and I, again, is 2022 was a horrendous year for both of us, and that's because we were both super correlated to US software. Um, and the lesson there is, um, well, I'm going to talk about Thomas's experience because he kind of had a learning out of it, which was... Um, he went through his portfolio and because it was an innovation fund, he, I think, categorized the investable universe into 20 different um, innovation categories. He found 19 of those 20 categories were decimated and he was like, okay, great. That's an explanation, but not a solution. Um, he recategorized them using a machine learning technique called clustering analysis. That's where you don't kind of say what is going to make, um, I guess, the classification happen. You just let the, the algorithm classify it according, like kind of based on trading patterns mostly. And so what he found was that 46% of his stocks were still in one cluster, but there are a few clusters where he didn't have any stocks, but you could see that they were mostly Korean stocks or mostly Japanese stocks. Um, and what that led him to do was some work on the Korean stock market and particularly the K-pop names. So he bought, I don't know if you know this, but the K-pop names are all, all listed. So he bought K-pop stocks. Bands. Yeah. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. So he bought those K-pop stocks and they did really well, but importantly, they did well in a way that was really different to US SaaS. And so that's really informed all that sort of diversification stuff that I was talking about earlier in the piece, um, where we think we can find things that are not correlated, but are still sort of, you know, good investments to be had okay last question for today and it's honestly my favorite because it is a challenge if the market was to close for the next five years they could only hold one stock and one stock alone what would it be and why i should say there's two very different tacks that fund managers seem to take with this question one is let's go the conservative defensive route we're not going to lose our money which is fine but not very exciting and sexy the <laughs> other the other route is what's you know the best growth opportunity in the market over the next five years a happy for you to take the <laughs> but very excited to hear what stock you have for us to be honest it's probably um i'm going to go with two i know you said one but it's probably um stocks that i've already mentioned so i actually think prismian is a really good buy over the next five years i just think that that need for you know the, the highways of energy are really really important um, and they've got a, they've had a proven business for like decades now and a good management team with a 5% free cash flow yield. So that's kind of like the safe play. If I wasn't so safe, I would say Chugai, which is that sort of Japanese um, pharmaceutical company I was talking about before. Um, that's actually still reasonably safe because they have a drug, an existing drug portfolio that is generating earnings and doing really well. But I do think it'll probably trade on how well those GLP-1 drugs do and they're going through sort of phase two and phase three trials. So it might be pretty volatile and, and you're still taking on biotech risk there. Um, so if I had to choose one, it would be Prismian. Um, and although I may look wild, I'm a capital preservation mode person. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to choose Prismian over Chugai. But if I was a bit more of a betting person, I'd choose Chugai. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Arms. I'm so glad we were finally able to sit down, yeah. have a little interview, have a chat. It was absolutely wonderful to speak with you. It was so much fun. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Ellie.